Welcome everyone. I'm Mike Gilliland, uh, Associate Editor of Foresight. I want to welcome you today and introduce you to today's speaker. Well, many of you already know Sherry as founder and chair of the Early Career Research Searcher section, now known as Early Career Forecasters going forward. Uh, Sherry's engagement with the IIF began in Rotterdam uh, at the ISF in 2014. But she really got serious after the 2018 ISF in Boulder. During one of the frequent downpours and hailstorms we endured while in, in Boulder that year, Sherry hitched a ride with Pam Stroud, IIF's business director. And to express her thanks, Sherry asked Pam, is there any, ever anything she can ever do to support the IIF? And apparently there was plenty of things that she could do. Because since that time, Sherry founded the ECR and continues to chair it. She has organized several ISF sections. She co-hosts the IIF's Forecast Impact podcast series. And she just this Sunday taught a workshop on judgmental forecasting. And outside the IIF, uh, Sherry recently got her first professor title. Now, Sherry wants to invite you to watch her embarrass herself this evening at the open mic talent show at the gala event. And of course, we encourage anyone else who is willing to do that to participate as well. Also, she's a photographer and wants to invite you to speak to her after this presentation if you'd like to sit down for a portrait sitting. On a more personal note, Sherry grew up in a house that had been converted from a cow stable and desires for some reason to once again live on a farm. Also, she currently lives in a house with no roof, which in the United States is something that we refer to as camping. And I'm not sure this is an improvement over living in a cow stable. But without further ado, welcome Sherry DeBates. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, it's on, just checking. Um, so my talk today, and I decided upon this title six months ago when I got the invite to do this session. And I thought it sounded really nifty, you know, man versus machine. It's like, you know, it's, it's a warrior statement. Are they enemies or allies? And then uh, about a month ago, when I started working on the presentation, I Googled the words man versus machine. And one of the first sites that I landed on said, well, that's not a helpful framing at all, because we are not going to a world where it's either man or machine. We are not enemies. We have to be allies. So I'm doing something that researchers are not supposed to do. I'm changing post hoc my hypothesis. It is now man and machine for the rest of the session. Um, I'm going to give you a short overview. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the fact that um, why did they put an academic in the practitioner track? It's a question you might ask. It's a question that I ask myself as well. And then I want to talk to you about communication. Yael also talked about this yesterday in a fantastic talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about communication, about the concepts of machine, algorithm, artificial intelligence, all those things. As a third point, I'm going to be talking about communication. And as a fourth point, I'm going to talk about communication. And to conclude, as a five point, as a fifth point, it will be the conclusion. Um, so now you think I'm joking, right? But I am going to be talking about communication a lot. So in the first one, I want to talk about the perception that we have about that word machine in man versus machine. After that, I want to talk to you, and I'm going to do something that hasn't been done a lot at conferences. I'm going to tell, talk to you about studies that I did that did not work out, that failed. So there will be some failure stories in there, and they were all due to communication issues. I will also talk some about research that did work out, that we can build upon. And then what and who do we need? And we need to foster communication among the rest of us. You'll be tired of hearing that word by the end of the session. And then I will end with a conclusion. Um, so the first question is, why did they put an academic in the practitioner track? Um, and I can guess at this, but I presume that it is because I'm actually, um, education-wise, I'm a psychologist, so I'm into behavioral science. I got my master's degree in industrial psychology, 
and I got my PhD in applied economics. And it was really, it's titled applied economics, but it was behavioral economics. So I look at human behavior and especially the value of judgment and decision making within the world of forecasting. Now, I've been through somewhat of a journey. Um, we have a bit of a different system in Belgium where before you start your PhD, you can work as a junior researcher. Yeah, you don't, you're a pre-PhD. And while I was writing my proposal as a pre-PhD, I was really optimistic. I was like, yeah, decision making. Judgment can really add value. You know, you have those cases where you have promotions, where you have additional knowledge. You know, the marketing uh, department is going to have a campaign. So judgment can really add value. And then I started doing research in my PhD. And I wasn't so sure anymore. And I started asking, can judgment really add value? Because what I was finding in my research, and a lot of it was together with um, Professor Nigel Harvey, is that people do add value, but at the same time, they do tend to damage the accuracy. And I always like to refer to that Lyman O'Connor paper from the mid 90s, where they were telling people explicitly, you are harming accuracy while you are now adjusting the forecast, and people just kept on doing it. Um, during my postdoc, and also for context here, in Belgium we do not have PI positions, we have long postdocs that are more or less the same. So we have junior postdocs, senior postdocs, and they're each three years. During my junior postdoc, I was getting kind of miffed and saying, why won't you leave that statistical forecast alone? It's already good, you're getting the feedback that it's as best as it can be, and you're still fiddling around with it. For my senior postdoc, I went a bit more high level and I thought this cannot be just the case in forecasting. It might be the way that we just deal with computers, with models, with automation. It might be our attitudes towards algorithms in general. Now, judgment, and this is an old reference and everybody has used it at some point, says, uh, literature favors statistical prediction over judgment. And I wanted to make a neat little reference list for you of studies that have confirmed them. I found this overview from 2000, so this is already 22 years ago, and back then this was the overview. I got a bit discouraged, so I didn't continue. So, and so in the meanwhile, publication rates went up as well, so there are a lot of studies that have confirmed this. And there was a movement for a while that said, we should just stop judgment. The problem is, you can't do that. There will always be judgment involved, and it is not possible of just stopping judgment. Paul Goodwin, for instance, had papers on restrictiveness and guidance in judgments, and they found that if you restrict people from making small adjustments, they just circumvent it and start making large adjustments which are even more damaging. Um, so it is a bit like this. It's when you tell students, you give them their exam papers and you tell them don't turn them around yet and start. As soon as you say don't do it, people tend to do it. So ending judgment is not the way to go. Now in forecasting specifically, um, I was originally gonna say our goal is forecasting accuracy, but our goal is of course everything that is associated with better accuracy, that is to provide better service levels, to decrease costs, increase profits, um, to have better sustainability. There are all kinds of consequences. If you were in the talk earlier here by uh, Polly, you know that there are many things that are associated with better forecasts, which is what we are aiming for. Now, uh, Robert Files and Photios Petropolis have been doing a lot of surveys with companies, asking them, for forecasting, do you work mainly with models? Do you work mainly with judgment? Or do you use a combination of both? Um, they found, and these are numbers of 2015, and it has, it has been a while, so they might have changed in the meanwhile. But they found that almost 30% of companies said, we rely solely on statistics. Judgment was 15%. We use solely judgmental methods. Those are often companies that don't have historical data, that are startups, they use it for no products. 
but the majority of the people uses a combination of both. So either making two separate forecasts, statistical and judgmental, and combining them, weighted or 50-50, um, but the most often method is, as most of us know, it's judgmental adjustment. You have the forecast software, run its model, and you adjust it afterwards. Now, I want to talk about this. I do not believe that. I do not believe that almost 30% of companies have no judgment. What I think they mean when they say we don't use judgment, we only use statistics, is that they don't use judgmental adjustment. But judgment is present in every phase of the process. When you are cleaning your data, what do you do with missing data? What do you do with outliers? Those are decisions that you are taking. What do you do when you are selecting your training sample? How narrow or how broad is it? How many, in what kind of buckets are you dividing them? That is judgment. Um, selecting the parameters for your models, often judgment. Selecting the model, and you can say, oh well, but you can use an, an evaluative criterion for that. Okay, but which criterion are you using? Again, judgment. Um, and then, of course, how are you, if you are going to measure your performance, which I've heard surprisingly from a few companies that they just don't do that, but if you are, and you are measuring your performance, which performance measures are you using? Again, judgment. So we have to conclude that it is both judgment and models, it's man and machine, that we are going to be working with in the future. It is not one or the other. So if we want to focus on increasing forecasting accuracy, we need to focus on that combination of both. How do we do this? Well, already in 2006, Robert, Paul, and Michael Lawrence said, we need to optimize the use of judgment in forecasting via the use of forecast support systems. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. No, it isn't. Easy peasy, lemon hard. Um, first of all, I do need to note, because I'm usually like the bad news person because I focus on cognitive biases, judgment does have its benefits. Yeah, there are situations where judgment, and Anna is smiling because we did a workshop together and I was the one saying judgment is bad and she was saying judgment is good. Um, judgment does have its benefits in specific situations, yes? The problem is that our human being human interferes in the cooperation between man and machine, between forecaster and forecaster software. Why? Because we have cognitive biases, such as over-optimism, we, we see patterns into noise where there are no patterns. There is a whole range of them. Also, we perceive things a certain way, we interpret them, and we have our own associations. That's just how our brain works. And lastly, we have a specific attitude towards certain things. There are people who have a favorite method. It's insane to have a favorite method. Your method should depend on your data, right? And we value certain things more than we do others. Some people have a really strong preference for a certain performance measure. And if you have them as a reviewer, you can really battle it out. Um, so all these things lead us to behave in a certain way when we are using machines, when we are using software, when we are using algorithms. We use them as we should. We abuse them in the sense that we adapt them or we fiddle around them when we shouldn't. Or we just disuse them. We don't use them at all. What is the use of having the perfect forecasting model if our human behavior leads to the fact that we're not going to use it? But we shouldn't forget, judgment is here to stay. That, that movement away from we should just stop judgment and focus solely on models that is done for, that is not realistic, um, we should always look at judgment and models together. So I'm going to talk a bit about the broader perspective. And that's why I called it man and machine, not man versus machine, because I want to look a little bit higher, because this problem is not unique to the forecasting world. Yeah, this is, happens in companies everywhere. And it is about the perception, the attitude, and the behavior of man with regard to machine. 
And as I'm specialized in that first bit about human behavior, that is why you have an academic as a practitioner keynote, I presume. So let's look at the first thing, perception of the machine. There are a wide range of words that are associated with this. We have robotics, automation, augmented reality, algorithms, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. I'm going to focus mostly on algorithms and AI, and I'm going to making, be making a mistake that a lot of people do, and that is I'm going to mix them up sometimes. I already apologize, but this is going to happen. Um, if you look at those things under machine, what happens is, um, this is typical for, this is a picture from Germany, but it's typical in Belgium as well. We recycle like crazy. So we have paper, glass, PVC, and then we have Restmull, which is the leftovers, which is everything else. And these things, if I talk with people about it, they're sort of intermixing it. It's just everything else, which is why I wanted to focus on man versus machine. I want to talk about everything in our cooperation with uh, things that are classified as machine. So, an algorithm, you will probably know this. It is a defined routine, program, procedure, a process or set of rules and calculations that are followed in sequence to solve a problem uh, to achieve some desired output. And I've added here, usually by a computer or technology means. Why? If you don't add that, you could say that a recipe for tomato soup is also an algorithm. Yeah? We're going to be focusing, of course, on computer algorithms. Now, I wanted to know what the general audience associates with the word algorithm. That was because of my failed experiments, but I will come back to that later. So what did I do? I asked people on LinkedIn and I asked people on Facebook the following question. If I say the word algorithm, what do you associate with it? This is the result that I got from LinkedIn. And I usually don't like word clouds, but in this case, it's really handy. So you see that a lot of the words are the same as the formal definition that I gave you. Process, instructions, problems, solutions, math, um, a logical way. Um, so it was all quite objective, quite formal. This is, of course, because a lot of my LinkedIn connections are within the world of forecasting. Um, there was one person who posted a link to a t-shirt, which he was actually wearing yesterday. Um, that is not loading. Well, that's a problem. It's not loading. It was a great picture from Stefan Colassa. Stefan Colassa, I don't know if you noticed yesterday, was wearing a black t-shirt that said algorithms. And then as definition, a word that is used by programmers if they don't want to explain what they did. Um, well, that's, that's too bad that it's not, that it's not uh, loading. But anyway, um, I asked the same question on a few Facebook sites. Yeah. And I made a word cloud of those as well. Now, some of the words are the same. Math, step, procedures, process. But then there are a lot of them uh, talked about social media. If I say algorithm, they said Facebook. They said Google. And they said YouTube. Um, they also had more negative things to say. The word complex was used a lot. Uh, the word help came up a few times, which is disturbing. Um, and black box. So when I say algorithm, they talk about complexity. Um, then there are those who talked about control. Yeah, A lot of them mentioned, together with the social media mentions, uh, mentions algorithms are used to control us, to control what we see to control the information, to filter the information for us. Um, it also said manipulation, that one appeared three times. And um, I'm going to see if there was another one, prejudice. 
confirmation of prejudice. That is what an algorithm does. Then there was one that I particularly liked. Someone said, impending insanity. And then there was one joyful person who used the word fun, turned out to be my boss. So that is the association that the general audience, professional and not professional, has with the word algorithm. We are also influenced, whether we like it or not, by Hollywood, by movies and series. And I gave a class on this a few months ago to students, and I asked them beforehand, if I say algorithms, what movies and what series do you think about? And they uploaded some of these. I don't know if you know them all. We've got Blade Runner, iRobot, The Matrix, Persons of Interest. They're actually all about AIs taking over. So they're all about what Hollywood loves to use about the point past the singularity where artificial intelligence has crossed human intelligence, keeps on developing, and is out of control. So if you look up the definition of singularity, it ends with out of control. That is what we are being fed in the media. Now, Google search results. Um, is there anyone from Amazon here? OK, that's a good thing. Um, so um, Amazon, for, you know, if you visit it and you search for something, you get this recommendation related to items you viewed. For a while, the Amazon uh, recommendation algorithm said, if you were buying a black baseball bat, maybe you were interested in buying a black balaclava as well. Not really the association we are wanting to make. What other examples do you find? Does anyone know who this is? This is Tay. Is there anyone from Microsoft here? Also good. Um, Microsoft developed a chatbot called Tay. And the goal of the bot was to learn from Twitter how to make tweets and how to interact with people and send out tweets themselves. So they wanted to have a tweet bot. What happened was it was named the AI with zero chill because what had the AI learned? It had learned that the interaction between people is racist and it started making derogatory posts and replying to people in racist ways. So it had to be taken offline after 24 hours, after a really long learning period. Going back to Amazon, with my apologies to Amazon, but they are leading the way, so naturally they are also the ones to first stumble upon these things. The recruiting AI of Amazon blatantly said, do not hire women for technical jobs. It was sexist. One that is a bit more lighthearted, and I'm not going to even ask this one if there's someone from the Scottish Football League here, but um, in and football as in soccer, yeah, the right kind of football, I know that was in Yael stock as well. Um, they, you know, if, if they're reporting uh, a competition, you have a cameraman standing behind the camera and he's following where the action is, yes? The action is, of course, where the ball is. So they thought, we can simply develop an AI that tracks the ball. They tested this, it worked out well. They had two live stream competitions, it worked out well. The third live stream competition, something went wrong. I'm gonna show you a video. The orange dot is where the ball is. Then you have to see where the camera is going to. So orange dot up top is going down. It's going down. And it's going down. Do you know what happened? The side ref was bald. Yeah, so the AI camera could not make a distinction between a ball and a bald head. So it was continually tracking the side ref with a bald head instead of the ball. So what happens, and I have this t-shirt and I couldn't find it to take it with me and wear it now, but what happens is, People read these stories, they recognize the funny ones, because of course, 
people love publishing about that. If you're a, a journalist, a writer, I mean, those things catch the attention, right? You're laughing with the Scottish football story, and you will remember that. So there is this movement that says, you know, AI, machine learning, all those algorithms, it's just, it's, it's, it's too much, it's, it's a bubble, it's never gonna be real, there are too many mistakes. Now what we think about as professionals is we think more about the business cases and the successes because that is what we hear at conferences like this. We hear the success stories, right? I'm going to be changing that, but we hear the success stories. We know about UPS that had an efficient routing algorithm which saved them 2.55 billion a year and their truckers had to drive less routes. We have IBM's AI Watson, which is a multi-purpose um, AI, but that has been used a lot in healthcare and is really good at predicting treatment for certain types of cancers. I mean, how awesome is that? That are the things that we remember. The same for Walmart. So they use a combination of machine learning, image processing with video cameras, with sensors. And uh, for instance, where people used to check have to check uh, every hour or so how the fruit was doing. Now they get a message, the bananas are going brown, maybe you should change them up. Or the traffic flow in your parking lot is decreasing, now is a good time to restock or to give your employees a break. I mean, that's fantastic, that's optimization, that's, that's, that's great news. So a part of us are like, yeah, AI, machine learning, developing models, this is great. And the problem is that we are sometimes over-optimistic and we are over-promising and we only see the good parts being presented here while the rest of the world uh, sees the stories that are against it. So there is some serious cognitive dissonance between what people are expecting that an AI can do or that algorithms can do and what they hear happening and those are the the funny stories of failures. And what we should do really, and this is my fantastic Photoshop ability, we should bring them together um, so that we have an overall general positive feeling, a general positive attitude when we are talking about things like AI potential and machine learning and algorithms. So now, this is research hiccups. I am going to tell you about research failures of mine. In the social sector, in the legal sector, in the military and in the government, as you can have seen, I have failed in a lot of places. First of all, we looked at the social sector. Now the social sector is very human oriented, yes? So you can imagine that if you go towards algorithms, they may see it as computers taking decisions for them, while they normally have a lot of decision discretion, a lot of decision freedom. So we thought that would, you know, that would collide with each other. We did a pilot study, and good that we did, because in our pilot study says, uh, the people said, all in the open common box, I don't know what an algorithm is. They were introduced to algorithms, but they didn't know what an algorithm is. So what did we do in our final study? Um, we changed the word algorithm, gave examples of algorithms that they use in their daily life, and we changed it to the word computer model. Then their reaction was, I don't work with computer models. They did, because we selected them for it, but they claimed to not work with computer models. They probably had something very sophisticated in mind, but if you use an Excel sheet or if you use a routing uh, or scheduling AI, you are using computer models, you are using algorithms. So in the social sector, all our findings were non-significant and most submissions were useless because people said, not applicable. The legal sector. In the legal sector, we wanted to look into risk aversion. Um, lawyers tend to be very risk averse. Uh, and our hypothesis was this risk aversion can be related to an aversion towards algorithms. Now, the thing is, we were right about risk aversion. It was very high, but it was so high that they didn't want to risk answering. Yeah? It depends. I don't wish to commit to a standpoint without knowing the context. I prefer not to say, yeah? So we had a lot of people opening the survey, 
indicating their demographics, closing the survey, and because they're lawyers, they all emailed us their opinion, and it was all like that. I do not wish to commit to a standpoint. So legal sector, no go. We looked at the Dutch military, which is currently using soldier data to profile their soldiers and to assign them to the best fitting region in the world, uh, the best fitting assignments. And we thought, well, it's interesting. Let's ask these soldiers what they think of it because it has important, um, it has important implications for them. Uh, so we did this with interviews. And we got nothing out of them except, I don't have a choice, do I? They were in the military and everything is extremely hierarchical. And if their bosses jump, they jump. If their bosses were going to be profiling you, they say, yeah, okay. So that was all that we got out of that. In the government, we went to the taxation office where there was automatic selection of suspicious tax submissions. Now, this happened to be around the type, time that there was some hiccup uh, in the Netherlands with the tax office. And as a result, our permission got retracted. Then we got it again. Then it got retracted again. Then we got it again. So it was, you can have the data. You cannot have the data. You can have the data. You cannot have the data. We're still currently stuck in the fourth phase. No, you cannot have the data. It's been two years ongoing. So social sector, they didn't think they were working with algorithms. Legal sector, I don't want to commit to a standpoint. Military sector, I don't have a choice. And in the government, it's back and forth and back and forth, and it's getting kind of frustrating. Research failures, yes. Um, now a bit more of a positive news, but actually it's not my research. Uh, research that has found things that are important. The first two are the concepts of algorithm aversion and algorithm appreciation. Now at first, they might seem a bit contradictory. You know, we appreciate algorithms or we are averse of algorithms. But actually, it's about the moment in time that you look at it. People were given the choice to take advice from judgment or to take advice from, alg from algorithms. Yeah? What Log et al. found was algorithm appreciation. If you give people the choice, they choose advice from an algorithm. What Deed first found was algorithm aversion. That occurs when you have chosen the algorithm, you see it perform, and it makes a mistake. Now, one of the first things that I learned when I went from the world of psychology and decision making into forecasting, that one of the first things I learned is the perfect forecast does not exist. Yes, forecasts are always wrong. It's a bit depressing, but forecasts are always wrong. Why there is noise on the data? You cannot have perfect forecasts. But people don't realize that what they see is an algorithm making a mistake and they are quick to abandon it. They start distrusting it or they start adjusting it because they think it's making a mistake and it can do better. To give you an example, and it's, it's also it's a feeling, right? Uh, to give you an example of the feeling of algorithm appreciation, I'm from Belgium, which means taxes. Yeah? I have to pay a lot of taxes. And I am very happy that the Belgian government has a tax system, a tax algorithm that fills in my online taxes for me. It checks all databases with my employers, with healthcare, with everything. It fills in for me. I can make adjustments, but usually it's complete and it's correct. I really appreciate that because I remember the time that my dad was filling in our taxes with books stacked high like that, all the forms of all the payments of all the, the the wage payments of the past year. I mean, I can't even remember where I put my notebook from, from yesterday, so it would be awful for me. So I really appreciate uh, algorithms. And now, don't panic. Algorithm aversion. Um, I tested this. This is the Windows blue screen of death. Yeah? This is not happening with the computer. That's why I said don't panic. This is a screenshot. I tested this with the same students a few months ago and nobody reacted. They were 22 year olds and they had never heard of the blue screen of death. So I felt really old at that point. But the blue screen of death, I think it was mostly, was it Windows 95, Windows 98, where that would appear out of nowhere. 
You had no idea why it happened. You couldn't do anything. Supposedly, there was control alt delete to go to task manager, but that didn't do anything. The best thing you could hope for was smash the reboot button and hope that it didn't happen again. If it happened multiple times in a day, you were ready to throw that computer out of the window. Yeah? Why is that? Why is that such a strong reaction? Because we expect algorithms to be perfect. We have a perfection scheme in our mind of everything that is technological, that is automated. And when it doesn't work out, it has this cognitive dissonance between expecting perfection, expecting logical performance, and it not happening. Now, Deed First did say in a follow-up that you can mitigate algorithm aversion a bit if you allow for some adjustment. But then the judgmental forecasters in the audience will have the same reaction as me. Allowing for some adjustment is the thing that is damaging accuracy. So is it worth it? There's another model that is important. So we've got algorithm version, algorithm appreciation. I've added a third book now, the technology acceptance model, which has been around for a while. You have the technology acceptance model that says how we look at, and, and depending on how we will use technology, depends on our perceived ease of use and the perceived usefulness. This was extended to this. There are external variables. Then there is the TAM2 model, the TAM3 model. And then I thought, well, there, should, there is probably a lot of extensions of a TAM model, right? The situation in 2003 was like this. These are the TAM models that existed in 2003, and it has been used a lot in the meanwhile as well. I especially liked the word demon. Um, it stands not for your inner demons, it stands for demonstrability. Um, maybe could have chosen a better abbreviation. Um, we also, based on a TAM model, have the automation acceptance model. And an important factor in there is trust. You might have heard that floating around as well. We need to trust our forecasting system. We need to trust our algorithms if we are to use them. Because distrust leads to more intervention. Distrusting the output of something leads us to adjusting it more. Now, I've been laughing with other people's models. Here is one of my own on trust in forecasting. Um, it is also a lot. Um, it was a study in a pharmaceutical company about planning systems, and trust was one of the main factors. Um, I've also had, together with Dilek Onkal and Sinan Kunul, a paper on trust in forecasts, and we found um, four different things that affect trust in forecast. So, we have various influencing factors. Now, if you talk about trust, how is trust often measured? Trust is measured via the behavior of taking the advice of someone or something. Taking the advice of judgment or taking the advice of an algorithm is a sign of trust or distrust. Um, so we have the advice-taking literature, which is a whole field upon itself. And there is something that's very important. It's called egocentric discounting. We love ourselves. Um, if we have an opinion and someone else has another opinion, we might be convinced to take it a bit into account, but we over-rely on our own judgment. Um, now, there is another interesting paper on forecast advice discounting, also from Dilek Ankel and her colleagues from 2009, and, and I kind of, I love that one. Um, and I, I simplified it a bit, um, with my apologies to the authors, but for representation purposes. Um, so they were given nine periods, and they were asked to make a forecast for period number 10. Yeah. Let's say that what people often do, they anchor on the latest data point, yet another cognitive bias, and they say, well, let's make this point. In a following phase, after they made this initial judgment, they said, well, here's some advice that is being given to you by expert forecasters. And they say, it should not be value two, it should be value five. Will you now adjust your forecast? So what did people do? They adjusted their forecast upwards, but not all the way. See, that's that egocentric 
advice discounting again. Uh, it's also anchoring on your own initial judgment. So they took the advice, but they kind of pushed their own advice in it as well. Now, in that same study, to another group, they said the same. It is now no longer the advice of expert forecasters. It is the advice of an algorithm. What did people do? They adjusted it far less towards the advice of the algorithm. So they took it into account far less. So if we look at the overview, we have the concepts of algorithm aversion and appreciation to take into account. We have the various technology acceptance models. We have the literature on trust, on advice taking, on uncertainty avoidance. Uh, like Ayal said yesterday, we don't deal well with uncertainty and it's very hard to communicate. Openness as a personality trait has been found to be important. Feedback, comfortableness with new technology, self-efficacy, is it mandatory versus voluntary use? the knowledge level, the experience level, the gender, and so on. These are all things that have been found to matter. Now, there is nothing as practical as a good theory, but maybe we're having a bit too much of them. So what and who do we need? Um, first of all, when I was making this, I thought, well, now I've got myself into a pickle because these are all important theories. Should I just now say that we should delete and no, we should not. Um, but I've thought of a few ways that I think it's important to move forward. And I'm going to show you this. These are the ways to move forward. And now if you all think that we need a good shave, we need to watch the Lord of the Rings session, we need a glass of wine and rolled peas, that would probably all help. But what I mean is this. I presume you can see what the razor stands for. It is Occam's razor. Yeah. We need to simplify because we have all these models. And if we are talking with practitioners, it is just not useful to go to them and present, here is a list of 57 variables that will impact whether your software is being used or whether your people will use the software. That's just not possible. That's not realistic. Um, and why is that important? We are not ivory tower researcher, and I know that's not an ivory tower, that's the eye of murder, um, but we are not on top of an ivory tower with the people beneath us. We are academics and practitioners that work together and we are in a very applied field. So our models should be able to be used in a very applied sense. Um, and to work further on the Lord of the Rings methodology, and I hereby win a bet because no, someone said that I couldn't insert two times Lord of the Rings in a presentation. This is Gondor, the city of Gondor, more of an ivory tower ironically. It is built upon the foundations of what we already have, yes? We need to take everything into account around us, what we are building on. And our research goal. Our research goal is not impact factor. Our research goal is impact. It is about making an impact into business, into uh, economics, into sustainability, into um, uh, the UN goals. It's about making an impact. We are doing this, well, I was gonna say we're not doing this for fun, but we are doing it for fun a little bit or we wouldn't be here. Um, but we need to make impact. It, I have never found uh, a, a subfield or a field of study that is so strong in the practical application section that is what we are working towards. Um, the other thing is, um, I don't know if this is an expression actually that's used in your language, but in Belgium we say add water to the wine. Now, um, I got married three months ago. It took them 15 years, but we got married three months ago. Um, and actually the mayor who married us said that this is the most ridiculous expression ever because all you're doing is spoiling a good wine. Um, but he said, 
you need to meet each other halfway. So yes, we can develop the most fantastic model that there is. But if we're not talking with the people who are going to use it, it's useless. Yeah? You can have the best model that there is, but if it's not used, why even develop it? So we need to have more of a balance between accuracy and acceptability. It is not one or the other, it needs to work together. And maybe it might be uh, the case that you have something that is slightly less accurate, but that is more acceptable, and that is way more useful than the perfect forecasting model that is not accepted. And this is the Kumbaya section, the world peace section. We need everybody. Yes, this is uh, work that uh, Paul Goodwin talked about yesterday. It is about going to the companies, about interviewing, and about getting every profile involved and thinking about the forecasting processes. So what are the conclusions? First of all, communication. Sorry, I had to put that in there. Um, also, we need to develop these fields together. So what is happening now is we're developing fields on machine learning, AI, modeling, the really technical people moving upwards. And then you have those on judgment. But there should be more cooperation. I get kind of scared when I see papers that have more formula in there than they have words. But actually, those are the kind of people that as a behavioral scientist, I should work with. Because that is how you come to something that is both acceptable and accurate. And we should not ignore the research that has been done. As I saw, there, there's tons of research that has been done. I said a parsimonious shave works every time but we do not need to shave away or throw away the things that we have found, but we need to make something workable. And what we need um, is just to fill in the gaps and make a coherent, workable model. So communication, cement existing knowledge together, make it workable, and travel the future roads together. We are multidisciplinary, yes? You see that in every session here, and I think that it's amazing that they can divide it up into specific sessions with specific teams because there is so much overlap in the things that we are doing. Um, it is one of the tips that we gave in the ECR session yesterday to young researchers that is explore. Go across your own little focus and work together with people from other fields. And you will notice that a lot of that you have in common and that you can have a sort of synergy in working together. And so my conclusion, in what started as man versus machine, that has now been named man and machine, my big conclusion is that in developing machine, involve man. That is the way forward. Um, so thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I'm kind of uh, morally obliged to make uh, a little uh, commercial for the uh, ISF ECR, which since Saturday has been renamed the ECF, the Early Career Forecasters. Our podcast, Forecasting Impact, do, uh, do listen to it. And uh, do add me on LinkedIn, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now or afterwards. Hope you enjoyed it. Questions, questions. Hi, thank you. A really nice presentation. Um, one thing that I wasn't able to fully grasp was there's already a lot of <clears throat> progress in human in the loop AI and AI ethics. In the case of demand forecasting, forecast management by exception has best practices have been around for several years, maybe even at over two decades now. And so you seem to be alluding to that, but you're also, your path forward made it sound as if those things, there, is there something wrong? Or is there gaps with those, with what's being done now that you see need to be filled? Um, they do exist, and I am in, in, in no way denying that. But I think that 
what we know, what is within our knowledge field as best practices, um, I mean, this audience is a specific subsection of the world, yes? Um, when I go to companies and I ask them about some very basic forecasting stuff, I notice that these things are very, very prevalent out there, not wanting to accept the forecast, thinking it's a black box, thinking it's complex, not wanting to follow the best practices. They say they have their own method, not tracking performances. And I think that maybe we are, that there's still a gap between what we are doing in academia, even in the applied field, even in foresight, versus what the majority of the companies are doing. The companies that are presenting here are also a subsection of all the companies in the world. The companies presenting here are the ones that are already advanced and that think that this is a very important thing. But there is a wide range of people, of companies, of organizations still out there that can use um, you know, more interaction and uh, in helping optimizing the process. over there. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you.